Presented by Caltech. Hello, it's my pleasure and my honor to introduce to you tonight Dr. Ellen Rothenberg. I've known Dr. Rothenberg for nearly 22 years now, uh, having met her when I first arrived at Caltech in 1994. To give you a thumbnail on her background, let me cut to the chase and tell you that it seems like Dr. Rothenberg is an elitist because she's only associated herself with the finest institutions in her career. She got her undergraduate degree at Harvard. She then went on to MIT to, I'm sorry, her undergraduate degree, went to MIT to do her graduate work with our very own David Baltimore. Then after her PhD, she went to Memorial Sloan Kettering, the famous cancer center in New York City. And after her postdoctoral stint there, she moved to the Salk Institute uh, down in La Jolla for a couple of years before coming up to Caltech in 1982. Now, while she's been at Caltech, Dr. Rothenberg has become one of the leading luminaries in the study of T cells. These are the white blood cells that course through your arteries, veins, and lymphatic system, searching for evidence of foreign invaders. Once they find them, they coordinate a response that protects us from infection. Importantly, we have different classes, different types of T cells in our bodies, and they do different things. And diseases that remove a particular class of T cells, uh, for example, like AIDS, have enormous uh, implications as they allow uh, the microbial predators to unleash attack on our bodies. What Dr. Rothenberg has focused her career on is how do these different classes of T cells develop to become what they are? And she has systematically identified the steps that the T cells go through as they are born, pass through infancy, the difficult stages of adolescence, and finally arrive in the full bloom of adulthood. In keeping with the significance of her work, Dr. Rothenberg has become a very influential voice in the fellowship of immunologists worldwide and serves as an advisor to no, no fewer than four of the top immunology departments and institutes around the world. But enough of these formalities. I'd like to share with you two of the things I've learned about Dr. Rothenberg because I was, my lab was a neighbor to her lab for many, many years. So first of all, the first thing I, I, I gleaned from that is that Dr. Rothenberg is one of the most broadly knowledgeable biologists I've ever met. And uh, even though Caltech on our faculty we have a few people that are actually pretty knowledgeable, but even in that group, she stands out for her tremendous breadth of knowledge in biology. I'm always astonished by the things she knows. And it's like, how does she know that? Second, she has an almost childlike quality of boundless enthusiasm for biology that is absolutely infectious. This no doubt explains why she has won no fewer than eight undergraduate teaching awards during her time at Caltech. I'm sure tonight both her erudition and her boundless verve will be on full display. But enough of this, I hand the microphone over to Dr. Rothenberg. Thank you, Ray, for a fantastic um, introduction, which I did not expect at all. And so I hope that this will be half as enjoyable to you as Ray has promised that it will be. I hope I don't disappoint you too terribly much. What I wanted to do today is to talk to you about what we've learned really about what Ray would say is the infancy, childhood, and early adolescence of T cells. And we've learned that this is actually um, very tightly tied up with the notion of what it takes to develop any kind of a cell from a stem cell precursor. And since there's an enormous public interest in the use of stem cells in artificial situations, I thought it might be particularly interesting to you to hear about this um, which is a natural system based on natural stem cells that our lives depend upon. 
And what I'm showing you here basically are uh, immature T cells stained uh, for different surface markers that identify them as being in different stages of this childhood, uh, infancy, childhood, um, early adolescence, and so forth. So um, we'll cut to the chase now. Now, all blood cells in your body from birth onward develop from true stem cells. These are self-renewing cells that continue to replenish all different types of blood cells throughout your lifetime. And these um, scanning EM pictures are of lymphocytes, and lymphocytes will be our main subject, contrasted with red blood cells, um, which have been falsely colored. But you can see the difference in morphology. Now, the, the T cells, the lymphocytes, are part of the immune system. And actually, the immune system is now recognized as being quite complicated. Um, it has at least two major branches. One is called innate immunity, and this has really been um, much better appreciated in the last few years than it had been previously. These are cells that you're familiar with when you get an infection and you have pus formed. These are actually little uh, kamikaze warriors that go um, commit suicide in the, in the defense of your body um, and, and, and leave their cadavers there on the, on the uh, field of battle. And that's what you're seeing. But they're only one kind of innate immune cells. They're actually quite sophisticated variants of them. The thing that they have in common is that all of the cells of a given type in the innate immune branches of the immune system have stereotyped recognition specificities. All of them are equivalent to each other, basically. And each one has multiple things that it can see. Um, but any cell is as good as any other at seeing those things. And um, they have a fast strike response in general. They don't need to wait in order to attack once they get triggered the right way. And this contrasts with the part of the immune system that T cells represent. Because if you had an immune system made only of T cells, you basically wouldn't live to be one year old. Um, they're slow. They're deliberate. Um, and part of it is the way they're used as a pool rather than as individuals. T cells as a group are armed with receptors that come in many varieties. So the, the, the population of T cells has an enormous diversity of structures that it recognizes. But each cell individually only gets one. And so that means that the cells are not equivalent to each other. You may have a cell over here that will fight off the influenza virus that's in your lung, but if that cell is the only one you have in your body and it's down in your foot, it's not going to protect you. And what that means is that um, in order for the cells to have an impact on your health, they, need to, they have a divide and conquer strategy, which has many advantages, in, in, which I'll try to tell you a little bit about later. But the initial point that that imposes on the system is that these cells have to be able to proliferate in order after they've established their specificity so their daughters finally give you a critical mass of cells with the same specificity enough to fight against a pathogen. And so the regulation of proliferation is integral to T cell function. Without it, they would be utterly useless for your body. And so this is something then that the T cells have in common with stem cells, and they have not got in common with the innate immune system, where proliferation is far less important. And so here's a picture from a, a blood smear um, staining where you can see a lymphocyte, which could be a T cell, um, next to a granulocyte, one of these um, very, very uh, harsh, rapid strike innate system warriors. They're about the same size, but they're completely different from each other um, in every way, except that they actually have a common ancestor, which is the blood stem cell. And the stem cells um, in, in your lives right now live in your bone marrow. Um, they're a very rare cell type in your bone marrow, but they live in particular niches in the bone marrow. And most of the time, they just sit there. And occasionally, maybe once a month, they will actually divide. And if your body is infected and you have a great need for more uh, blood cells to come out to ac actually attack, um, you may actually stimulate more proliferation of these stem cells so that you can actually get them to start differentiating and make multiple types of blood cells. Now, this is really a lot of different types of cells. And even though they have in common being small, basically round, and mostly circulating in your blood, the fact is that as cells, they're quite different from each other, different 
lifetimes, different proliferation rules, different effector functions, different triggering rules. And so one of the questions that's integral to the system is not only how the stem cells decide when to start proliferating and differentiating at all, but how do they control the balance of the cells that they're going to produce? Um, you're essentially, every one of these stem cells has the capacity to make all of these. The stem cell was laid down as a stem cell while you were a fetus but you may be 60 years old and that stem cell will be able to supply your body with the right mixture of these cells. How does that possibly work? How does the cell code that information? How does the pathway of differentiation get guided? Now, to answer this question, we have to really turn to the realm of molecular developmental biology. And um, this, uh, this division of biology and biological engineering at Caltech has for many years been a center of great excellence in developmental biology. But most of the biologists who study development here are actually interested in a form of development that characterizes making embryos from fertilized eggs. And if you're going to make an embryo, you have a fixed amount of time in which to do it, and all the cells have to be on the same clock. You know, if this cell is going to differentiate to a certain point and migrate over to this side of the embryo to interact with that one, that other one had better show up for the appointment with the right stuff in hand. And otherwise, you don't get an embryo, you don't, and the species dies out. And so the embryos tend to be rigid about timing. Um, but stem cells, as I just told you, are not rigid about timing because all of the stem cells in your body that are going to be producing blood for you um, throughout your lifetime were set down as stem cells when you were a fetus. And essentially, the population is maintained by the fact that they don't all differentiate together. They have to do it separately. So that means that each cell has both a, ch a possibility of going forward to differentiate and a machinery for holding back. And this is going to play a role even in the production of cells like T cells, which are descendants of stem cells. Now, the main thing you have to realize about development in general is that to a very good first approximation, all the cells in your body inherit the exact same DNA from the fertilized egg that you came from. And so all the cells in your body that are expressing totally different functions are doing it with the same genomic blueprint. What they have to do is they have to express different parts of the genomic blueprint and leave others silent and different cell types are distinguished by which genes they express and which ones they don't express. And so the real question is how development takes one fertilized egg that has the capacity to generate all of these gene expression patterns and actually allocate the right gene expression patterns to these cells, those cells, those cells. And the answer is in the mechanism of gene regulation. It turns out that if you look at any gene in your body, it comes with two kinds of biological information in it, in your DNA sequence. One is one that you've probably, many of you learned about since high school or grade school, which is the genetic code of A, C's, G's, and T's, which code for uh, segments of proteins called amino acids. And the coding regions of genes, which I've sort of made very short here in this picture just because I'm not going to talk about them very much, these are the parts that code for the proteins. So your lens in your eye is transparent because of lens crystallins, which are proteins that are, um, that are transparent. Your blood is red because it codes for hemoglobin protein, which actually carries oxygen, and that is a separate protein. And the, the sequence of the DNA that codes for hemoglobin or that codes for lens crystalline is here. But let's face it, your eye lens would not do very much good for you if it was expressing hemoglobin. And so you have to arrange to have the hemoglobin expressed in your blood and have the lens crystalline expressed in your eye lens. And that's what this black part of the diagram is supposed to represent for these genes. Because in addition to the protein coding sequences in the, gene, in the genes, each gene also has what's called regulatory sequences. And we're much less good at reading regulatory sequence than we are at reading protein coding sequence, but the cell is very good at reading it. And what is this regulatory sequence? The regulatory sequence consists of landing pads for a certain class of proteins called transcription factors to bind to. And different transcription factors bind to different DNA sequences. And each gene has its own instructions for 
expression built into the sequence, which it uses as its regulatory sequence. So here's gene A. Its rule is it will go on if it has the dark blue factor, protein uh, transcription factor bound here, and two copies of the light blue factor bound here. And if they're both there in the cell and bound, that gene will go on. Gene B, though, will have different rules. It may also use blue and cyan factors, but it'll use them combined with a third factor, this red triangle factor. And this gene won't go on unless the red triangle factor is there and the cyan and the dark blue. And gene C may also use the cyan and the dark blue, but it only goes on if you also have the green triangle factor and the orange triangle factor. And so the genes, that's in the, that's in the genome. The genome actually has the sequence and that specifies which transcription factors have to bind in order to turn on the gene. So if you have two different cell types, one and two, say this cell type has the dark blue, the cyan, the red factor, and this cell type has the dark blue, the cyan, and the orange and the green factor, you can predict what genes they're going to express. Gene A only asks whether the cell has dark blue and cyan. So both of these cell types satisfy that condition. It's on in both. Gene B needs the red factor as well. So the cell one satisfies that criterion. Cell 2 doesn't, so gene B will not be on in cell type B. And gene C, you remember, needs the orange and green. Cell type 1 cannot provide that, so it's off, um, but it's on in cell type uh, 2. And as a result, this, this genetic code combined with the information about which transcription factors these cells are expressing sets up this cell to have a different gene expression pattern from the other. Those of you who are interested in um, coding and information will obviously see that I've drawn this as AND logic. There are versions of this which include components of OR logic, but basically there's always a strong component of AND logic in the control of any of these genes. And what you can imagine is that if one of these genes, like gene B, actually is the gene that codes for red, then once you've turned on gene B, you will help maintain the cell type 1 phenotype for a long time, OK? So what I've just told you is that the cell type specific gene expression is what defines a cell's identity in the body, and that what determines what genes the cell will express depends on the combination of transcription factors that cell expresses. That means that that cell differs from another cell most fundamentally in terms of which transcription factors are different between that cell and its closest relative. And if you work back to the developmental process, what the developmental process has to accomplish is to accomplish the, diff the expression of these transcription factors and the separation of this cell type from another cell type that has different transcription factors. So these are the terms in which we're going to try to understand the development of a T cell identity from a cell that was a stem cell before. Now, what we know about T cells is that they develop from stem-like cells, or the immediate descendants of stem cells, um, not by staying in the bone marrow where the stem cells are hanging out, um, but actually by migrating out of the bone marrow. And they migrate as cells that are still multipotent um, through the blood, and a few of them a day, very small number a day, settle in the thymus. Now the thymus is a, you've probably eaten it if you like sweetbreads. Um, it's, it's a white, sort of amorphous looking organ that sits above your heart. Um, and its job is essentially to provide a particular kind of schooling for these blood cell precursors that will force them into the T cell pathway. It's like a kind of boot camp, or you could say it's like a religious seminary. Um, essentially, the cells come in diverse and they come out programmed. And this is, and we know what the critical environmental signal is. It's that the thymus structural uh, milieu, which is made of non-blood cells, um, expresses molecules that are called delta. And these molecules interact with receptors on the surfaces of these immature blood cells, which have this very strange name, notch. And the notch-delta interaction actually delivers an instruction to the cell that begins a cascade of gene expression changes that's going to program it to become a T cell. And this notch delta signaling, the delta in the environment, the notch on the cells, um, is actually going to be the main environmental stimulus that pushes them into the T cell pathway. 
And what you see is it causes this slow but cumulative way, starting at an early stage and going up until the cell has a completely defined um, uh, identity as a T cell. And it's at the end of this process that I'm going to focus on today that the cells finally begin to express these recognition complexes that I mentioned earlier, which as mature cells they're going to use later, patrolling around the body, looking for, as Ray said, pathogenic alien invaders. Um, but the cells, through the period where they're learning whether they're going to be T cells at all, they don't have those receptors yet. Um, they're basically going to first choose to be T cells before they actually turn on the machinery that makes those those receptors. So if you think about making a T cell um, as a developmental problem for the body to solve, you realize that um, the very diversity and versatility of, of T cells that Ray mentioned is actually a little gene expression challenge. Because all T cells have some properties completely in common. They all have similar classes of signaling molecules that they're going to use to interpret signals from the body as they circulate around looking for pathogens. Um, but at the same time, they will specialize according to what kind of function they'll play. Um, they'll either be helpers or um, sort of suppressors, or they'll be killers, which can be quite um, violent cells. And in each case, they have to be first armed with these subset-specific functions um, superimposed upon their common T cell functions. And they also have to have environment-dependent triggering of those functions. So what I'm saying is that a, a T cell m may be absolutely recognizable as a T cell one to another, but uh, they'll have these shared T cell functions that are going to be always expressed once they've established the regulatory state, the transcription factors that run those genes. But, but the T cell identity is still dynamic, and the cells can still specialize, and part of their specialty is this response to environment. So they have to have fast response uh, uh, types of gene regulation, sort of subset specific gene regulation, and T cell common gene regulation. Very, very complicated layering of, of roles. The other thing is, just to make it worse, they have this issue of the multiple recognition specificities. In fact, to get the ability for each cell to recognize to a first approximation a different possible threat in the body, it actually takes the genes that are going to code for the triggering receptors, and it actually subjects them to a, a really frightening program of somatic mutation. That's part of the T cell development program. The cell actually beats up on its DNA and deliberately introduces mutations and then throws away the cells that have messed up the genes irrevocably, but saves the ones that have now got new variants of the genes um, which are going to be useful to the body. Needless to say, um, this means you have to start with a lot of spare capacity. And anyone who wants to use Occam's razor um, on this is going to be very disappointed because the, uh, the T cell development program overproduces T cells by about 50 to 1, and it kills them back. Um, ruthlessly. And so this means that not only do the cells have to be programmed for this complicated layered type of gene regulation, but they also have to um, be made in a very large number. So let's look at the stages of this process where this is happening. And here's where the somatic mutation process is kicked off. Um, and the cells reach this at the end of a period where, in fact, they go through a lot of proliferation. I told you that a few cells come in, but there's at least 10, maybe 12 rounds of cell division of each precursor before they get to the point that they can start this. And two to the 12th, you know, we, we're talking about you know, 4,000 fold expansion or more. Um, from each cell before it even gets to this point. So the proliferation is really important. And if you start uh, this somatic mutation process, which involves slowing down the proliferation to let the mutations be put in, um, if you start that prematurely, you simply can't make enough T cells. The other thing is that if you ask what the cells can do other than be T cells, it's very analogous to um, sort of going into a seminary or a nunnery. Um, when the cells first come in, they have many options. And they go in, and they initially don't have to give up irrevocably all the other possibilities in their lives. 
And if you, as long as they stay in the thymus, they will turn into T cells. But if you take them out in these early stages, you can see that cell for cell, they're actually still pretty good at becoming other kinds of cells. They are not only good at forming other kinds of lymphocytes called natural killer cells, they can also form cells of the innate immune system quite efficiently. They only lose that ability at this particular point called commitment, which is obviously an important stage. And this is something then um, that we want to understand, and I'll be spending a lot of time talking about that. How can we study commitment? One of the things that makes it easy has been a very useful in vitro culture system that was developed by a, a wonderful scientist in Toronto named Juan Carlos Zuniga Flücker. Um, and so it's a challenge to pronounce, and I left out the diacritical marks on this. But, um, but he's been a very creative guy for a long time, and Tom Schmidt in his lab um, about 13 years ago developed a system that allowed you to take a culture system which would be supportive of hematopoietic blood cell development into everything but T cells, and with one gene added, he could convert it into a system which coerced these cells to become T cells. And the thing that he had to add was the notch ligand delta, um, the same molecule that's expressed by the thymic environment. And that one molecule is enough to turn this supportive cell type into a very coercive nursery for the generation of T cells. And what that means is that we've been able to take um, precursor cells, in this case from fetal liver or from bone marrow, that are still able to do all kinds of things. You can put them into the original type of stromal culture system, and then you can show that they can give rise to all of these other types of cells. Um, or you can put them into this T cell coercive environment, watch them become T cells, count the cells, take them out along the way, analyze them, put them back again, take them out, perturb them in some way, put them back again, take them out, move them to the other environment, see what they can do. And this is how we know that up to this point, if we take the cells out of T cell permissive conditions, they can still give rise to all these other types of cells. After this point, they can't anymore. So that's the commitment to assay. So the question then is, how is the decision made to become a T cell? And I told you that the answer is going to be mechanistically at the level of transcriptional regulation. So what are the positive regulatory drivers of the program? What are the transcription factors that have to turn on? How are they turned on? But the other thing is, why does it take so long for the cells to give up their multipotency? And what, what's the resistance that the T cell program is pushing against? And this is just a portrait of um, one of the analytical methods that we use to distinguish cells in different stages from each other. This is a very powerful technique called uh, multi-parameter flow cytometry. And I'm just showing you each dot is a cell that has a higher or lower level of one surface marker called kit or another surface marker called CD25. And the cells start out like this, and then they move to here, and then to here, and then to here, to here. If we use this kind of analytical approach with a sorting technology that allows us to say, I want to sort the cells that meet these criteria, we can actually physically isolate these cells, do things to them, put them back, and watch them progress through. And so we're going to be using that kind of technology then um, through this talk. Now, one thing we can do with the cells is we can first find out how do the cells before commitment, these two stages, differ from the cells after commitment. And one extremely valuable thing about being at Caltech has been a marvelous collaboration I've enjoyed um, with my colleague Barbara Wold, who has been uh, sort of the inspiration for our genomics facility at Caltech. And since the whole human and mouse and many other genomes have been fully sequenced, it's turned out that a very efficient way to find out on a global scale how one cell type compares with another is simply to take these cells, purify them, take all of the RNA in each of the cells, that's the, that's the uh, action copies of the genes that are being expressed that are going to be used to make proteins, just purify the RNA from those cells and actually compare the sequences, the actual nucleotide sequences of those RNAs against the genome. And if you get 10 hits on the sequences from one gene and 350 hits on the sequences for another gene, you know that the ratio is basically you know, 35 to 1, the second gene over the first. And you can do that with every single gene, every one of the 25,000 odd genes in the genome, all from the same sample. And 
because a lot is known about what the genes code for, um, it's been possible to use that kind of information to look really globally at what is going on in the cells and what is changing. And this is a summary of an enormous amount of data um, that I just want to group together for you so that you can get a feel for um, the complexity of the pattern, but what some of the players are. This is a time course. These are the cells before they go in the thymus. And this is the first stage. Second, here's where commitment occurs. These are the committed cells. This is after they get their receptors arranged. And these are the names of transcription factors. They're the transcription factors that the cells start with from the beginning and carry all the way through. There's others that they start with but don't carry through. They're only expressed in the early stages. There are others that only turn on after the cells are already in the thymus. Some of them turn on here, and some of them turn on here. And we're going to be getting up close with a few of them. This one, GATA3, this one, TCF, this one, BCL11B. But first, I want to spend a few minutes talking about these initial uh, regulators, because they actually tell us something about that timing issue and also about the proliferation issue that I just mentioned. Um, essentially, the T-cell program is built on a stem cell foundation. And I think one of the big surprises that we had in getting into this field was to see how much stem cellness the cells still have and still maintain throughout their first 10 or so cell divisions in the thymus. They have many of the regulatory genes that control stemness um, are still on in these cells. Furthermore, they encode factors which themselves regulate other stem cell genes. And so they actually work in a circuit to try to keep each other on and also to slow down the progress towards being a T cell. The notch signal basically has to beat on them cumulatively um, uh, above to, to reach a certain overall uh, intensity in order to finally overcome the resistance of the cells trying to stay stem. And, and yet, this is the context in which the first T cell specific genes are activated. So it's not completely resistant to turning on the T cell program, but it still keeps the cells in this kind of push pull situation am I stem, am I T, am I stem, am I T? And we think that uh, I'm going to show you just a tiny bit of data to suggest that the stem cell legacy is actually being used as part of this proliferation requirement um, that the cells have in order to build up the pool of cells. And, however, after using this stem cell legacy, as I'll tell you in a second, the T cell precursors absolutely need to shut it off. And this is this set of genes then that uh, are, I'm very uh, abstractly representing this way, but they come in at high levels in the cells, and they're basically turned off. Different ones in this group are turned off at slightly different times, but pretty much all of them are off either during commitment or a little bit afterwards. And so um, what do they do? And it turns out that these are very interesting and very evocative genes. Now, if you're not a biologist, if you're not a leukemia person, if you're not a stem cell person, none of these names will mean a whole lot to you. But if you are, they do, and they stand out um, very dramatically. First, um, one of the things about these is that this set of genes that the cells keep on is very full of known regulators that control the ability of stem cells to self-renew, to make more of themselves, to keep the stem cell population replenished whenever it loses um, some members to differentiation. And these are well-known factors that have been studied in terms of maintaining stemness. People who want to be able to grow up human blood for transfusions to help immune deficiency patients or people who have had other kinds of blood loss um, are very familiar with these genes as some of the good guys in the early stages of the process because they help support the ability of the stem cells to build up to large numbers. Um, and, and for the progenitor cells that are immediately downstream from the stem cells. Also, it's very interesting, um, this set of genes include many uh, that are specific regulators for features of other uh, blood cell differentiation programs. So this one, PU.1, is important for making innate cells. The, uh, this one and this one are important for making red blood cells. And um, this one and this one are very important for making B cells. And so these are basically multitasking transcription factors. Part of what they're doing is helping the stem cells self-renew. But what comes along with that function is the fact that the cells still keep a door open towards becoming something else. 
And the, the, the kicker in all of this is that a number of these genes, quite a number of these genes, have a well-attested history in human biology as T-cell proto-oncogenes. That means when t human beings get T-cell cancer, um, T-cell uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemias especially, many of these genes are actually abnormally upregulated and they are actually involved in the, um, in the process of the leukemia, leukemia generation. So, this whole stem cell gene expression period poses really two kinds of danger to the developing T cells. One is lineage infidelity, that is not to become a T cell, but the other is just leukemia. And so are they really doing anything good? Well, as a matter of fact, they are. And this is an example, there's three of these that I think people have studied pretty extensively. One of them isn't really a transcription factor, it's a growth factor receptor. It's part of this, uh, stem and progenitor cell program, but it turns out in early T cell development, this is an incredibly important growth factor receptor. These two are transcription factors that regulate genes, and it turns out that this one and this one, although they're never gonna be expressed in mature T cells, they don't have a role there, nevertheless, they have a very big contribution to the ability of the cells to proliferate enough in these early stages. And in this upper part, this is from work from Peggy Goodell's lab, um, the white bars are the cells that have lost this factor, LYL1, and they just simply can't build up to the levels um, of the normal cells in these early developmental stages. They can sometimes sort of pull it out with compensatory mechanisms later on, but you can see there's a big difference between this and this. Um, here's another factor. This is one which actually has a role in making innate cells, um, but er it's expressed in early T cells. We've spent a lot of time working on what this one does. And um, this, in this case, it's the one that loses the gene is the black, and you can see it really fails to proliferate um, as well as the control. So it's really a problem. And so these, cell, these genes, while they're expressed, are doing good things for the cells. Um, but they have to be down-regulated. Down now, does this really matter? Oh, yes, because as I mentioned, the phenotypic associations are very strong with human um, malignant lymphomas of early T cells. And they're, you can actually do experiments where you add these genes um, to cells which are trying to develop normally, and they'll get diverted into leukemia. Um, and so this, this is quite clear. And we've actually come across a mouse strain that has a spontaneous set of mutations that fails to turn these off properly. It's just, it just happened to develop this way. And it turns out this mouse strain gets a lot of um, pre-leukemic cells and then progresses to um, malignancy soon afterwards, very, very frequently. So it, these genes do have to go off at the right time. And it turns out that um, we really have these genes going off during commitment but after um, the first T cell specific transcription factors come on, GATA3 and TCF. And so the question is, um, what, happens, what happens to make these genes go off and what happens after they go off? And it turns out there's a third wave of T cell transcription factors. And we're gonna spend the rest of the talk focusing on what happens at this point in terms of the positive regulation of genes that are gonna be needed to make the T cell program. The final rate limiting mediator of T cell commitment turns out to be one of these transcription factor genes that's turned on during commitment, turned on as the stem and progenitor genes are going off. And we're gonna be talking about what it does and why it's turned on when it is to cause commitment at that stage. Now, we had been sort of interested in BCL11B before, but what really cemented our interest was some of the genome-wide analysis of the changes in gene expression as the cells go through commitment. And I'm just showing you a graph that is sort of abstractly depicting some of the results from this, because what we did was we compared the cells before commitment and after commitment. We looked at all the genes that change expression. We co selected the ones which are known to code for transcription factors, threw away all the others, because the transcription factors are the ones with the power in the system. And then we asked, um, you know, let's rank them in order of how down-regulated they are or how up-regulated they are as the cells get committed. 
And so here are those stem and progenitor genes. They all get downregulated pretty much. But here, if you look across the whole genome and you're ranking all of the genes that code for transcription factors across the whole genome in order of how much they get upregulated, it turns out that one of the top two in the whole genome is this one, BCL11B. Obviously, we have to know what it's doing, and it wasn't very well understood at all a few years ago. It also turns out that BCL11B is the most T lineage specific transcription factor known. That is, of all of the blood cell types, um, this one is the one that's the most restricted to T lineage cells. And so, again, you have to be respectful of that and say, what is it really doing? To begin to see uh, the details of it, um, a postdoc in my lab named Haoyuan Kui um, made a mutation in the mouse genome which puts the gene that codes for a yellow fluorescent protein into the, the tail end of the gene that codes for BCL11B. And he stuck it in, in a way that doesn't disrupt the BCL11B gene, but allows the same gene to code for two proteins, BCL11B and this yellow fluorescent protein. And then we can use this nice analytical capability, which is based on fluorescent detection of different things, to ask, OK, if we look at this cell type, this cell type, this cell type, this cell type, how fluorescent are they in this yellow color that's coming now from the BCL11B gene? And what you could see is that the early cells are basically showing background levels. These cells are showing background levels. Um, it's a log scale, so this is a 1,000 times brighter than that. And the cells that are past the commitment point are all expressing BCL11B pretty well, here, here, here. This is a lot of expression. The interesting action is happening right in here, in the cells that are about to undergo commitment. And here you see two peaks. And it actually turns out that you could use the fluorescence from the BCL11B uh, tagged locus to sort these cells and compare them. And in this case, it turns out that there's a very clear distinction functionally. If you put these cells into the non-T conditions, they can still give rise to all kinds of other things. If you put these cells in, they're committed. So the BCL11B upregulation exactly coincides with the commitment event. So this is a, at least a great marker. But is this just cause or effect? And so to answer that question, what we've done is we've found a way that we can actually cut out the BCL11B gene at will, taking mice that have the BCL11B gene flanked with sequences that we can use as sort of uh, detection sites for molecular scissors that we can introduce into the cells, chop it out, they close again, the cells now were fine up until that point, but now they don't have BCL11B anymore. Now we can challenge them. What would they do in T cell development? And we can compare them with the controls. And basically, they actually behave very nicely. Up to the point where BCL11B should turn on, they're just like the normal, just like the normal. But then, obviously, the fates diverge. Whereas the normal cell goes on to become a get all the markers and properties of the committed cells and go on and express T cell receptors and so on. This one, without BCL11B, does one of two things. One is it jumps out of the T cell pathway altogether and becomes a natural killer cell, which is another kind of cell. Or it actually just never decides to grow up. And this is where the analogy with um, adolescence is really amazing, because these cells don't die. Um, but as long as you keep feeding them, keep giving them notch signals, keep giving them growth factors, they will just keep growing and growing and growing and growing, but never maturing. And so really, the, uh, they, they fail to turn off the progenitor genes. Um, they fail to lose uh, access to the other fates. They're basically uh, in arrested development, but quite happily there. So this says that BCL11B really is important. And it says that it's functionally important, its timing is important for commitment, because without it, the cells can't commit. With it, the cells do commit. And so now we have to know what makes it turn on when it does. Now, we know that notch delta signals have to be important, because none of this would happen without notch delta signals. Um, and we know, actually, that the notch delta signals have to be sustained for cells to stay in the T cell pathway. But as I'm going to show you in a second, notch delta signaling can't explain it all. Because let's face it, it's been going on since two stages before the cells turn on BCL11B. So what takes the cells 10 cell divisions before they turn on BCL11B? Could it be these earlier T cell transcription factors that are induced by the notch delta signals? And so in order to get some 
uh, handle on that, what we've done is we've taken our BCL11B fluorescent reporter my, uh, mice as a source of cells that we can actually follow through the process of going through T-cell commitment in this neat in vitro system. So we can put them in uncommitted and we can watch them become committed and see what we can do to affect the rate and the, and the efficiency with which they turn BCL11 beyond. And there are a couple of things we can do with this. We can actually make movies of the cells. We can make movies by putting them under um, a fluorescent microscope while they're developing and do time-lapse uh, cinematography on these things to see basically how the cells turn on this um, yellow fluorescent protein. And this is one way that you can analyze the changes in the rate of expression of the gene. Um, we can also take these cells and put them in the flow cytometry analysis to see what is correlated with the uh, expression of the BCL11B yellow fluorescent reporter. And we can put these cells in two kinds of systems. Um, one of them is the, our usual in vitro system where we have actual stromal cells expressing delta, but they're also providing Let's face it, you know, cells talk to other cells. So they have some other cell surface molecules. They may have adhesion molecules to sort of grip the developing T cells towards themselves. They may also even make some growth factors. So the cells love this, but we can't really totally control the situation. We can also just be very minimalistic and take the notch ligand delta, purify the protein, and stick it onto a naked, bare tissue culture plate. And then it is all alone. Um, but we can also control its concentration. We can control its density on the plate. And we can control just how much growth factor we add to the system. And this way, we can actually get quantitative relationships of how much of an input different kinds of signals are producing in the cells. And these are just pictures of what we see in some of the movies. Um, these are just still frames from this, but here are cells at day zero. You can sort of see this reddish dye that we use to just locate the cells themselves. And by day three, these particular cells have now turned on BCL11B in a large fraction of the population. You can see them. It's pretty obvious that they're turning yellow. And this is just looking at the time course tracks of individual cells that we've tracked by analyzing the movies um, to ask this particular cell, how much BCL11B fluorescence was it showing at this time point, at this time point, at this time point, at this time point? What about this cell? This time point, this time point, this time point, this time point. And you can see that the cells in the population are turning BCL11B on with different kinetics. They're not all turning it on at once. You can also see that the notch signal makes a difference. Because if you put them in the conditions with a notch signal, a lot of them turn it on after 36 hours. If you put them in the absence of the notch signal, only a few of them turn it on. It's interesting that some do, but a few, only a few do. So the notch signal is important, but it really can't do it alone. And one of the features of this is that um, we're going to see this as a pattern. The notch signal is important to pre uh, set up the precondition for BCL11B to be able to be expressed starting from the e earliest stage, the DN1 stage. But by the time the cells get towards DN2A, some of them can turn it on without the notch signal. And the, the killer is um, once BCL11B is fully turned on, it doesn't matter. You can take the notch signal away. It really doesn't care. So whatever notch is doing, it's not acting as a continuous valued input to control exactly how often um, the gene is used to make an RNA coding for BCL11B. Um, it's not an immediate sort of volume regulator um, for this gene. It's a permissivity regulator. So what else is there? Well, it turns out that you could see that there are other things that change in the cells that turn on BCL11B. And this is a new collaboration with um, Long Tsai's lab. I'm at Joshkun in, in Long Tsai's lab and Mary Yui in my lab, really to look um, at the single cell level at exactly what are the characteristics of the individual cells that turn on BCL11B, that distinguish them from the others in approximately the same stage. And here what we're doing is we're using a, a nucleotide hybridization method to detect which genes are being expressed and exactly how many copies of the RNA from those genes are present in those cells. And here, for example, is a very immature cell. It's expressing a lot of PU1 RNA. Those are the red dots. But it's expressing a little bit of this TCF factor. That's the green dot there. 
Here's one that's a little more mature. It has more green dots. And here's one that started to turn on BCL11B, and that's the yellow dot here. You can see that there's actually three of them in a row right here. And this is a cell which is distinguished by having less PU1 dots and more TCF dots. And here's one that's more mature, more BCL11B dots, more TCF dots, very few PU1 dots. So you can use this kind of thing to see what, what are the conditions that the cells have to have fulfilled in order to get to that point. And there's genetic evidence that say TCF is needed for BCL11B to be turned on, and it can help to turn BCL11B in the absence of notch signaling. There's also the other early activated factor, GATA3, also turns out to be important to turn BCL11B on. There's another gene, which is actually one of the uh, progenitor inherited factors called RUNCs, um, which can also be important to turn BCL11B on. So now we have an overabundance of causes, but how do they actually work together? I mean, I talked about AND logic early on, but what does this actually mean for the gene in these individual cells? Are these factors all working together? Do they have to essentially crystallize at the same time? I already mentioned the notch signal becomes dispensable after the gene is on. So what's happening here? And this is where we've been very interested to see how this works, because it first looks complicated, and then when you zoom back out again, it makes a lot of sense. So first, we've been able to ask at what stage is the GATA3 important, at what stage is the TCF important? And this is just a series of plots of results from experiment where we took the cells at these stages before they turned on BCL11B, um, just before they turned on BCL11B, or just after they turned on BCL11B. And we did some chemical tricks to the cells to knock out the expression of either GATA3 or TCF. And then we looked a few days later to see how well they turned on BCL11B. And the answer is that if you knock them out from the early stage, before, when none of the B cells are expressing BCL11B yet, if you knock it out at that point, it has a terrible effect on the ability to make BCL11B. It's a big fold change. But if you get them a little closer to the border, it doesn't make so much difference at all. And if you wait till they've already turned on BCL11B, it's the same story again. The cells really don't care anymore. They keep the BCL11B on, even if you take these inputs away. So, um, What's regulating BCL11B once it's on? I mean, we have all of these things that are required to make the cell capable of turning it on, but nothing so far that makes it go on. Well, actually, ironically, the factor that does control how well it's on turns out to be the one they inherited from the stem cell. It was waiting there patiently in the wings, unable to regulate BCL11B until the others fa other factors had worked. But once the gene is on, now if you play with the level of RUNCs, you get a resulting change in the level of BCL11B. Take it down, BCL11B goes down. Add more, BCL11B goes up. And so effectively what's happened on the gene itself is we have really two processes. One is a door opening process, and then the other is to let in the actual controller who's actually going to run the gene uh, thereafter. And so, you can draw a network picture like this, and my, my late, very, uh, very lamented colleague, Eric Davidson, used to love to draw gene networks, which would show how the logic of a developmental process flowed through a cascade of gene activation, one gene coding for a factor that would activate the next gene, and then the cell sometimes returning the favor, sometimes collaborating to turn on other things. But what I just told you is that although there's this collaboration, it's actually a qualitatively distinctive collaboration. These Factors actually are playing different roles, and we can understand what they do um, in a much more interesting mechanistic way as taking the gene from being dead silent off in the precursor to making it ready for activation, and then opening it, and then stepping out of the way so that the, uh, the hands-on regulation can be done by another factor. Now, you don't need to understand this figure. This is simply to tell you that I've only told you a little bit of the story and that we know a lot more about this system than I told you. We know a number of the details of this process. We know some of the uh, control sequences in the DNA through which some of these regulators have to work to cause these events. We can actually order some of the actions of these factors. We can actually see that the BCL11B gene starts out wrapped up in a very closed part of the genome. It's hard to open. And that part of what these factors are doing is essentially opening it, 
literally opening it, literally making it available and, and changing the structure of the, um, the winding up of the genome in proteins uh, in the nucleus. And so um, this is an extremely interesting process and it has a number of timing features in it as well. And at the end of it then, the runks can get to this gene and the uh, usefulness of things like the GATA3 is, and the notch no longer is, is, uh, is required. So why use such a complicated amount of machinery to set up the expression, but simple machinery to run it afterwards? And I think that the answer is that the T cell identity has multiple conditions involved, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and you have both making a T cell. BCL11B, once it's on, will never go off again in a T cell. All T cells, no matter what kind they are, all have to express BCL11B. That's part of their T cellness but they're gonna use the other factors for other things. For example, um, some of the helpers are going to be high for GATA3 and TCF, but killers, which are also perfectly good T cells, are going to be GATA3 low, even though they still keep TCF. And there's a very important regulatory kind of T cell that prevents you from getting autoimmune disease called Tregs, which can be high for GATA3, but they have to be negative for TCF. And they actually have the highest requirement for BCL11B of any of these cells. And yet they can't do it with TCF. And these guys can't do it with GATA3. So by using this kind of hit and run machinery um, and now handing off the control, you've established the T cell specificity of BCL11B expression by making the, um, the system hard to turn on. But once it's on, easy to keep on. And this is what a systems biologist would call hysteresis. Um, and this is a very, very concrete, molecularly a detailed version of that process. So I told you really about two phases of the, T, of the early T cell programming process. And I told you about some of the events that occur during the first phase set up uh, enable and then and then set in motion the second phase, um, and I, what I really want you to end up with is not these details, but the picture of what's really happening in T cell development. This protracted process with all of this proliferation going on, and you can see that this early phase has a job to do. It basically has to take this tiny number of incoming precursors and get them to proliferate. You have to build them up so that there are enough of them so that you can now give them diverse T cell recognition receptors and you can afford to throw 49 out of 50 of them away on the ash heap um, when they don't meet your quality control criteria. You, and this proliferation is essential to get the diversity in the first place and to leave any cells alive at the end. But at the same time, the cells have to eventually finish this. They have to wean themselves off of the stem cell-like factors. And they have to do this by creating a one-way gate to T cell identity, which is involved in this commitment event and the upregulation of BCL11B. And it's because of the asymmetry in the activation requirements of this commitment factor, BCL11B, that the cells now become free to take that whole mass of different transcription factors and use them now not for T cellness in general, but use them to diversify function to serve these elegant and specialized roles in the immune response, but never ever go back to stemness again. And so that's the end of the T cell story. And I just want to thank the people who've been involved in this work. Um, I highlighted a lot of work by Haoyuan Kui, um, and some, the last complicated slide was um, a very, very quick um, uh, summary of very interesting work that he's done with um, Kenneth Ng, who was originally a California Stem Cell um, Institute uh, intern and who's been a wonderful member of the lab. But I have to give uh, real, real credit to Mary Yui, who's the person in the lab who first discovered the commitment event and who characterized it and gave us a way to look at it and who's continued to play a role in all this work. And Jingli Zhang, who's the person in the lab who really started our collaboration with Barbara Wold's lab, which has been so extremely um, fertile. Haoyuan has been a joint postdoc in a very, very happy collaboration with Michael Elowitz's lab, and they brought this uh, live cell imaging into our lab. It's been wonderful. Um, Mary has been spearheading a collaboration with Long Tsai's lab, where we've been able to look at the single cell level at these single molecules. Um, of course, we couldn't have done, do, done anything without flow cytometry and sorting. These marvelous people over the years, um, supervised by Shelley Diamond, and we've gotten many uh, wonderful mice generated at Caltech, manipulated at Caltech, and donated by people from other uh, 
universities. And thank you so very, very much um, for your attention. And I hope I didn't take up all the time for questions. Thank you. Thank you.